Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris. This is the Weekly Spinner Rack, where we are going to talk about all sorts of comic book stuff that came out this past week, from new comics like Transformers or the new Punisher to, uh, let's see, the Marvels came out, Loki had its season finale, uh, and there's just a ton of interesting comic news to riff on. If there's time, I'll also draw. I would like to. Let me do some shout outs to people that are here early. Lovely to see everybody in the uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. This channel is almost at 10,000 subscribers. That's that's a nice little achievement, I think. Uh, thank you all for, for jumping in. Appreciate it. Lovely to see uh, a mix of new faces and, and uh, familiar names. That's awesome. Uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. We always do because... Uh, I do this caffeinated coffee. That's the secret ingredient. I just realized that I don't know where I put the latest issue of Transformers. I've got a bunch of the comics that came out this week right here. And for some reason, I don't know where I put Transformers number two. And that one is kind of like the fun one to talk about. I love Daniel Warren Johnson stuff, man. Uh, huh. Oh, well, uh, we'll deal with that when we get to it. Right. Um, what's, let's see what, came, what happened this week. Um, I tell you what, I don't usually talk too much about what I do in my day to day life, but I'm kind of proud of something. So I wanted to share it. I still have a day job. Uh, you know, YouTube's awesome. It would be fun to do it full time. Um, but I have a real job and, and it keeps me attached to the real world. It definitely keeps me humble. And I, and I love my coworkers and I, and I usually like the work. Uh, I sell cars. I sell, so I'm a car salesman in my day to day life. And, um, there are sort of, you know, levels that you can reach depending on how many cars you sell and like various statistics behind the scenes in terms of how you're doing well. And, uh, I reached a, 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 a pretty high echelon there called a diamond status. And I'm just, I'm, I'm honestly proud of it. I've been doing this for over five years. Um, and, uh, and it's cool. You know, I get, I get paid a little bit more and I, um, if I want, I can take out a car, uh, that, that we have for sale. I can just, I can just, it's called demoing it. And so I'm kind of proud of myself that I reached that level, uh, at work, you know, um, Maybe someday I'll do this full time, but I, I don't know how realistic that always is. Uh, and I'm I'm just kind of proud of myself for um, doing that because most people uh, only stay in sales, you know, two years or a lot less. There, there's, there's a fair amount of turnover, but uh, so I'm proud of myself. Uh, anyway, um, what else is uh, going on? Just sort of fighting seasonal affective disorder. I, I think I'm pretty upfront that, you know, I've got like depression issues, but that's okay. I think, you know, I'm staying on top of it. I'm eating healthy, getting some exercise, socializing as much as I can. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, that's just uh, what's going on behind the scenes. But uh, is there anything else? Well, tell you what. No spoilers, but let me just talk briefly about two Marvel things that happened this week. Uh, Loki season finale and the Marvels. Uh, first of all, overall, I enjoyed both. So if you're looking for me to come out of here guns blazing, uh, that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm really not here to take either of those projects down. I enjoyed both. I probably also can't, you know, um, shout from the mountaintops that these are the best products they've ever created. But um, let, let's deal with that one at a time. First of all, no, again, no spoilers. I liked season one of Loki possibly a little bit more than season two, but season two was really interesting in what it did with the character of Loki. And it ended in a great, very satisfying place. It really gave the character an incredible character arc and a journey uh, that had some real uh, depth to it. It had some real meaning. I was really, really impressed with, with how it wrapped up. Um, and then, um, that, that's all I've got to say about that. Also, uh, the Marvels came out and, um, I knew that it was getting, going to get plenty of outrage, you know, basically any of the superhero stuff that stars a lady or a minority tends to get that, uh, you know, but, but also like Marvel's been, uh, 
not as strong ever since they passed season uh, phase three. You know, it's it. Some of it I like. Some of it's been weaker. I mean, Secret Invasion that was outright a bad TV show. Just just outright bad. A waste of Samuel L. Jackson's talents. Uh, to say nothing of his supporting cast like Ben Mendelsohn and stuff. Uh, just I don't have a recommendation for that. Fortunately, you don't need to have seen it to uh, enjoy the Marvels. Um, you know, Thor four was pretty weak. Uh, it, it was, it was okay. Uh, but it was a waste of somebody like Gore, a great villain. that was just sort of there. Uh, the Marvels I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed, I'd give it some, something like a B, not a B plus, not a B minus a B. Uh, I think that that's pretty darn good though. All things considered, this is somewhat popcorn entertainment. Uh, I think that every scene Ms. Marvel was in Kamala Khan, you know, that actress, Simone Villani, just stole stole the scene. She's really, really entertaining. Really, really good. Um, you know, special effects are, are solid. There's nothing weird about them or anything. Um, villain wasn't too much of anything, but wasn't really the overall point either. Uh, you know, good enough. Good enough. Uh, maybe it could have been elevated another level with another villain, but that also would have increased the runtime. And this is like, you know, Pretty compact action adventure with some good character beats. I liked all the characters. I thought that there were a few funny moments. There's a scene with a bunch of cats in it. And, and I won't get into exactly what it is. But there's a bunch of cats in it. And it's an action scene. And the music choice was one of the songs from the musical Cats. So, yeah, that's a meta level. But, again, the original Captain Marvel had... Captain Marvel fighting in the nineties and they played like, you know, some Gwen Stefani song. So, you know, it, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I do recommend it folks. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the news on it. It, it. it didn't have a spectacular opening weekend, but if you look at the audience reviews, they're very strong. Um, everybody that's seen it has, seems to enjoy it for the most part. I, I really do like it. Um, I, and, and I have no problem at all recommending it to people. So, uh, just a couple little things that were going on in the real world. Um, I know I missed a ton of comments and stuff like that, but, uh, yeah, let's see. Kamala's a top tier character. I, I agree. She's really entertaining, you know, um, her being a fan girl of superheroes that that's a great angle um hello daniel hello ej uh let's see i haven't seen any movies on the first two weeks for a long time just so more yeah uh, this one's good this one's good um oh thanks owens uh reviews yeah uh did an interview with joshua williamson if you're curious like i think we had a really fun interview um, talk a little bit about his creative process, his introduction to comics and his background with comics, uh, talk a fair amount about the upcoming Energon universe and his role with like what he's deciding to do with GI Joe. Uh, that's kind of the, the focus that, that I went with on this interview easily could have talked, you know, for, for ages about all the DC stuff that he's done or, you know, his, his introductory, uh, uh create our own comics, but he was a really nice inter interview. Uh, I hope you uh, get a chance to check it out. I think, I think it was a lot of fun and you can learn some stuff. Let's see. Um, the Marvels probably had the least developed villain since Caecilius and Dr. Strange and her evil plan is cribbed from space balls. Uh, there's, there's some truth to that. Um, but you know, I also don't think that every single movie needs to use an A-list villain, uh, especially not when we're like, planning on continuing to make these movies you know like th there are lots of comic book issues that have spider-man going up against you know the kangaroo or leapfrog uh some sometimes you don't need to have the uh the top tier villain you, you save that for something you build up to anyway uh that's a lot of me talking about me isn't it um i have not seen the killer that's the new one um with michael fassbender on netflix uh, i'll see it if i can uh yeah, tricky. I don't have tons of free time. Like, trust me, like I, I to decide to watch something like uh, the Marvels or Loki, I can justify a little because I'm like, OK, well, I talk about comics. It's good to, to stay uh, involved. But that also means that, you know, I'm, I'm deciding 
not to spend uh, some time maybe with a friend or maybe not go for a hike or certainly not play a video game at home. You know, like those are the choices I have to make to fit everything in. Um, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, let's see. Bronze Age Nerd is here. Chris, I can't stay long. Thank you for the super chat, by the way. Uh, I can't say long, but I wanted to thank you so much for what you did for the Heroes for Heroes charity event this weekend. You helped so much. Oh, dude, that's so kind of you. I was happy to help. Folks, uh, Bronze Age Nerd has a great comic book YouTube channel. Um, does a few more things with uh, the collecting aspect than, honestly, I, I would consider myself an expert. But he does some good interviews. Uh, he had Tyler Maine on recently. That's an interesting one. He played Sabretooth. The guy's making a comic. Um, uh, but yeah, like Bronze Age Nerd had a, a, a long live stream um, raising money for uh, veterans for Veterans Day. And I donated two pieces of art that I'm going to be mailing out soon, like a, uh, a Doctor Strange piece and uh, and a Baroness piece. And so like those were donated to charity, raised some money. He had some great giveaways. So thank you. But thank you for the super chat, man. That's really, really kind of you. Um. Ba, 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 ba. What else? I think that's plenty. I think that's plenty. Let's get into the news. Once again, nailing it with the the, the uh, thumbnail game. YouTube is just that algorithm is going whoo, through the roof. Just having fun, folks. Uh, let's get into the actual news that we have. Here's one that like connects with me on a personal level. Danny Earls, pretty new artist uh, in comics, but one that I like his work. And I had the pleasure of getting to meet him uh, just, uh, what, like a month ago in New York at New York Comic Con. This guy's got such an interesting life story. He's uh, from Ireland. He's a professional. He, I mean, now he's a professional comic book artist, but he was a professional football player. Played for nine years in the, um, the United States uh, uh, Soccer League uh, for a number of uh, teams. Uh, really incredible athlete. You know, you meet him in person and you're like, mm, this guy's definitely you know one of those guys like greg capullo or doug monkey that like actually takes care of their body and stuff and he's young he's still young um he's gonna um join the hulk run and the hulk run right now is really strong it's very monster based which is cool so yeah um you know he's it was right about this time last year gail simone saw his work at the Thought Bubble Comic-Con that takes place over in, I think that town is called Heritage, but it's in, in the UK, okay? And she loved it, as well she should. Uh, a lot of pros have a good eye for talent and, and started talking him up, and uh, he got a lot of gigs uh, in the last year. Uh, covers for no one uh, seen right here. Uh, did the recent, just like within the last month, um, Aliens, uh, Graphic, not graphic novel, excuse me, um, one shot annual, uh, did a Darth Vader story, uh, did a cover for Big Game by Mark Miller. Big projects. He's making a name for himself very quickly. This is all in less than a year. Uh, well, he announced, this is like a little tweet that he has up here. Uh, he announced this week that he's going to be drawing Incredible Hulk for some issues after Nick Klein wraps up his current arc. I obviously forgot to put in the letter C there, but I did not mean Nick Klein's current R. That doesn't mean anything. That That's nonsense. I wasn't trying to make some sort of a pirate joke out of nowhere. I meant to type ARC. I made a mistake. You saw my first mistake. Congratulations for watching. Um, anyway, mm. really talented, lovely guy. Um, just, just. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see somebody that's like, you know, just passionate about this. And think, guys, to be a professional athlete, that's a pretty top tier achievement. You know, you, 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 it's beyond just having good genetics. You have to have some real drive because of the competition. I do feel that that kind, that level of competitive spirit and, and hard work can translate into other fields. And I think it's translating for him into comics. He's always loved comics. He decided he wanted to be a comic book artist. He's making it happen very quickly. Kind of impressive. No, uh, let's just be clear. Nick Klein is not leaving the book. Uh, you know, comics uh, require a level of detail where it makes it very hard to keep up with a monthly schedule. So it's just that um, uh, the Incredible Hulk run has already had like two fill-in issues by Travel Foreman. Uh, they're going to have some more fill-in issues 
uh, art wise by uh, right now, Danny Earls. Great storyline going though right now where like, just all these monsters throughout the Marvel universe are, are honing in and hunting the Hulk. You know, we're talking everything from like zombies to Lovecraftian uh, kaiju sized demons uh, to things like man thing. Uh, so it's really, really fun. Really, really fun. Um, yeah. If you want to see him do some interiors again, I recommend his, uh, it should still be out in stores. Uh, alien. There was an alien, um, like annual or one shot that just came out completely silent, by the way. So that's an interesting uh, achievement in storytelling. Hey, it's uh, our old friend Steve Sorensen dropping in saying, oh, hi, hope all is well. Give this video a like. Hey, folks, you know, I hopefully that's not a big ask. If you guys are willing to just take a second right now while you're watching to hit the like button underneath, that really helps the channel. Just so you know, that like shows YouTube that there's more engagement than just passively watching something in the background. Uh, and it means it recommends it to more people. And then I can get some ad revenue. So I'm grateful if you can do that. Let's move on with the news. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Anybody that knows me knows that I am a big fan of Ninja Turtles. If I had my way, folks, I'd probably just have a YouTube channel where all I talk about is Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joe all day or something like that. Um, fortunately, I think my interests uh, go a little beyond that. But but I do love that stuff. And this was just a fun piece of history. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It should be silent in space. No one can hear you scream. Good one, Joe Dent. You guys can bring the joke so that I can just sort of sleep through the show. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ninja Turtles. Uh, a lot of people know that uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird co-created this 40 years ago now. 1983, folks. 1983. And that they met in um, the Northeast. Really close, really, to where I grew up. Uh, they were living and uh, not living together i should say in 83 but they were working together they were collaborating in 83 uh and they that was in dover dover new hampshire little town called dover new hampshire i believe kevin eastman who was a little younger was doing sort of summer work working like um you know at like lobster restaurants and stuff like that while um, Peter Laird, I think, was doing like political cartoons for a local newspaper. Anyway, they met up. They were they 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 connected on their shared love of Jack Kirby and comics in general, and they created Ninja Turtles, which is just what a what a thing to have created. And and you see two pictures here. This is what the town of Dover did to uh, bring in a little tourism, I'm sure, but also you know to commemorate this uh, this achievement. Uh, and some of that is getting a manhole cover, which I got a kick uh, out of. So this happened just this past Wednesday. There was a celebration up in New Hampshire. I don't suppose I'm lucky enough that anyone uh, in the chat room was there. Uh, you probably have uh, spoken up. <laughs> but yeah, for the 40th anniversary, they've got this. Uh, what do you call these? Like, it's not really called a plaque. There's like an official name when a town has like a history uh, sign, a, a sign about like their local history. But I can't think of what that term is right now. Anyway, so they've got that like um, spelling out the uh, story of the creation of Ninja Turtles. And they've got this manhole cover, which, you know, has like sort of a cutout design of the first issue and, and some details on uh, its creation. So, um, Kevin Eastman showed up there and he spoke about how he and Peter Laird started their turtle odyssey at 28 Union Street. Historical marker? A bunch of people are saying historical marker. I, I, I guess that is the term I'm, I'm looking for, a, histor a marker. Yeah, I think, I think that that's probably the term. It just wasn't coming to me. But anyway, I love Ninja Turtles. Uh, Dover is, you know, just a quiet town where, you know, people either retire or go for like more like the summer and stuff like that. But yeah, just uh, really cool to see it get to um, celebrate the turtles in a, in, a, in a way like that. Maybe someday I'll get there when I'm visiting family. We'll see. When I first put this news item in my working document for the week, I wanted to tell you guys about some Hellboy Christmas candy. But before uh, we got to Monday, 
it had all sold out. So that <laughs> the the little uh, title I came up with here is that the it was going to just be like Hellboy holiday candy available, but it changed to sells out. So Mignola, Mike Mignola, the creator of Hellboy, teamed up with a brand called Chocolate FX to release Hellboy chocolates for the holidays. Uh, they did a commemorative tin with this new original artwork by Mignola. I love Mike Mignola's artwork. Um, they sold out within about a week of it becoming available. Oops. Of course, Erwin. Yeah, the, if you look at the description for this video, for, for um, any of the weekly spinner rack, there's a P.O. box in the description. So if you'd like to send something like that, please shoot it to me. Every once in a while, I'll do an unboxing video on this channel and uh, take a quick look at something like that. So I'd, I'd, I'd be flattered if you want to do something like that. So uh, jumping back to Hellboy and Christmas here. Uh, here, here's what you would have gotten if you were lucky enough to to order in time. Uh, it comes with a bunch of peppermint bark. Love, pe I, I don't have candy anymore because I'm avoiding sugar. I have for a couple years, but boy, that would be. I love peppermint bark. I love Christmas candy. Oh well. Um, then they had like branded candies, you know, like little icons that. Mignola did, and they would have had salted caramel, yum, almond praline, or praline is really how you'd probably pronounce that, pumpkin pie with graham cracker, eh, not my favorite, creamy milk chocolate ganache, apple cider caramel, never had that, that sounds fantastic, uh, pistachio ganache with cherry pate de fruit, maybe, creamy dark chocolate ganache, Hazelnut praline with candied hazelnuts. Spicy hot chocolate ganache with vanilla bean marshmallow. That sounds fun, man. That sounds fun. <laughs> yes, I agree with Chemdog. Where are the knockoff Hecklad chocolates? I would, I would get those if they could make them in these uh, flavors. Yes, I know. I wanted to spread the word. I guess they had a limited supply. It's not, you know, Hershey's or something. They, they... They did a limited sort of pre-sale. Maybe if they see that it's sold out so fast, they'll re-release it. I'll let you guys know if I hear anything like that. They have sugar-free candy. I should look into that someday. That could be fun to, to have candy again. You're right. Sugar-free candy would probably be a, a treat. I think the one that sounds most exciting to me would be apple cider caramel. That just sounds really lovely. But anyway, praline, um, praline. See, there, there were tons of um, that that the, those cookies down in New Orleans when I went to college, and I thought that they pronounced it praline, but maybe it is pronounced praline. I don't know. Haven't thought that far ahead. No, I I don't know what's for dinner. Good question. We'll move on to something that's uh, more available. Iron Maiden. If you don't know, um, Bruce Dickinson is the lead singer of Iron Maiden and is um, a big fan of comics, I guess. Uh, and there's a new project uh, that he's got coming out that's a comic book. And I wanted to mention it because it's got an artist I really like working on it. So, um, yeah, Bruce Dickinson is teamed with Z2 Comics. If you haven't heard of them yet, uh, Z2 mostly does comics i think maybe exclusively does comics with musicians they did like you know a weird al anthology and stuff like that so uh he's make he's he's sort of like overseeing the creative idea he's not scripting or drawing it but it's it's his idea there's going to be a 12 issue comic series that will also be collected into three trade paperbacks uh next year it's scripted by tony lee Art by Staz Johnson. Guys, if you don't know Staz Johnson, just a fantastic British artist. Uh, has done stuff, you know, like Judge Dredd and Rogue Trooper over there in the UK. But has done stuff like Batman and uh, 
I think Avengers. He's done a ton of Marvel and DC stuff too. He's great, really underrated. There's a few artists out there that I consider underrated. And I'm like sometimes surprised that they're not like huge icons or something. I'd, I'd say that like Staz Johnson and Lee Weeks are, are two that jump into my mind as, as just great artists, artists, artists that you can really respect. Um, Maiden Rules. Staz is good. I'll have to look Staz up. He's, he's fairly active with sharing his art on uh, social media. Um, yeah, he's, he's really good. He's really good. So that interests me more than anything else for this. Uh, it's called the Mandrake Project. That's the overall idea. Uh, it's described on the Iron Maiden website as, quote, a dark adult story of power, abuse, and a struggle for identity set against the backdrop of scientific and occult genius. I guess that's a little vague. I don't know. Uh, one of the first things coming out for the Mandrake Project is an eight-page prequel comic that will come with a seven-inch vinyl here to promote the upcoming solo album and tour by Bruce. So uh, if that's your thing, you can find more on Z2 Comics or on the Iron Maiden website. Um, well, main reason I'd recommend it is Staz Johnson's art. He's really, I think he's really good. He's really good. I would love to see Staz on some sort of like, you know, a, a traditional action adventure set maybe in all around World War II because he likes drawing stuff like, you know, like um, Rocketeer and stuff like that. Hold on. Am I? Let me double check. The, I thought I was. Might be having trouble uh, getting a full charge on the camera that's uh, there. Well, if it dies, I've got a backup camera. It's not as good resolution, but if it dies, I'll, I'll figure it out. I don't know. I don't know. Moving on. Uh, wow. I, I was excited. This this is, yeah, probably out of the news that I'm talking about, this is the one that excited me the most. I was really pleasantly surprised by how good Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow was. Limited series written by Tom King, art by Bilquis Evely. Evely, probably. Uh, it was great. It was really good, but I'm not here to talk about that. And I'm here to talk about them reteaming for a completely new project, uh, which you can see a little bit here. I've got an image. So it's going to be a six issue series through Dark Horse this time. Uh, it's called Helen of Windhorn. And this is what the solicitation read. Following the tragic death of her father, C.K. Cole, the esteemed pulp writer and creator of the popular warrior character, Othan, which I think is sort of um, going to be a daguerreotype for Coney and the Barbarian. Anyway, uh, Helen Cole is called to her grandfather's enormous and illustrious estate, Windhorn House. Scarred by Cole's untimely passing and lost in a strange new world, Helen wreaks drunken havoc upon her arrival. However, her chaotic ways begin to soften as she discovers a lifetime of secrets hiding within the myriad rooms and hallways of the expansive manor. For, for outside its walls, within the woods, dwell the legendary adventures that once were locked away within her father's stories. So, uh, some sort of a meta-narrative, I don't know. All I care about is the team. Um, they've earned my goodwill. That's awesome. I'd love to have an interview with Tom King sometime. He, you know, he's he's an interesting guy. I'd like to I'd like to talk to him someday. We'll see. Uh, looks amazing. Uh, whoa, great comic cover art. It is. Look at how uh, Bilquis Evely has sort of. You, you almost don't even notice at first, but then like as soon as you see this sword here, like you can't ignore it. I love the way it's sort of swirling into the clouds. You see like, I guess her grandfather's face, you see like these thorns are sort of claws. Everything is very subtle, um, but it's, it's really good composition because there's just like all these circular elements that are drawing your eye constantly uh, around and then into the center. I mean, think about how long it would take just to, you know, map out and draw such a lovely manner let alone like, you know, an interesting person, an interesting environment. I don't know. Like sometimes the, the fundamentals of art really impress me because 
you know, being somebody that at least draws, if not draws well, but at least draws, I, I just know the time and, and, and the imagination it would take. Mm. I'm able to be here for one of these. Didn't think I would. Always happy to have you here, Cara Bear Comics. Beowulf loves Tom King. I hope Tom knows. I bet he'd appreciate it. Looks great. Going to have to add that to the pull list. I, I am too. Yeah. I Who's? Okay. Uh, it It's probably this name here, Matthias Lopez, that's the colorist. I don't know that for a fact, but it is great colors. I agree. Everything here is like a cool palette. Technically, there's like, you know, the yellows and the, and the reds are a little bit warm along with this pink. So it really does make her pop uh, without being too abrasive. Really, really good. Anyway, uh, I, I got excited because of the creative team. If you haven't read it, it's really worth picking up that Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow trade paperback. When James Gunn mentioned it, the sales on Amazon just went through the roof. Like James Gunn seems to mention one of these DC projects and it just ooh, skyrockets. In fact, last week we were talking about how DC comics um, announced that they're going to make these things called compact comics, $10 smaller uh, digest forms, but like a full stories, you know, like 12 issue stories, like Batman, hush uh, watchmen, things like that. Uh, far sector. They should really uh, strongly consider adding Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. It's it's more recent and new, but it, it, I think it would do well. Uh, let's see. What's his current book out? Uh, what is Tom King writing right now? That is a great question. I know that he's got an upcoming modernized take of Animal Farm because that entered the public domain. Um, that's not out yet. And we've got this Helen of Windhorn. I don't know what his sort of monthly is. He's probably doing something at DC, but I, I don't know off the uh, top. Oh, why am I so confused? It's because he's been doing like the um sort of like 12 issue limited series. Excuse me. So he had just wrapped up uh, the incredible human target and now he's doing Danger Street. Although I think there's only about two issues left of Danger Street, but Danger Street is his current book, Danger Street. Oh, and Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, which we talked about last week week wonder woman is very good so tom king's really been winning me over for a while I, I, and i'm not trying to idealize him but he has really been winning me over um for the last couple of years with like just consistent good ideas um danger street probably isn't for everybody i like it a lot it's it's a very weird uh sort of a book but i do think that supergirl woman of tomorrow human target and wonder woman would all like really connect with any comic book fan. Very strong, very strong. I, I've been talking about Danger Street. It's got a weird idea. Okay, so if we go back to early 70s, I forget the exact year, DC had about, uh, well, 13 issues of something called like DC Issue 1 Special. And each issue was meant to potentially launch a new series. One or two of them were existing characters like Creeper or the New Gods. A lot of them were new ideas. Uh, things like Lady Cop, which is just weird. Uh, anyway, what Tom King is doing with Danger Street is he puts all of those characters into a shared world. So you've got Warlord and Metamorpho and the original blue alien Star-Lord, Lady Cop, uh, the Dingbats of Danger Street. The Green Team, uh, Codename Assassin, Manhunter, The New Gods, they're all spinning around and, 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 and encountering each other and, and, and interacting in, in very strange ways. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's a lady, but a cop. How can that work? Well, there was a time where women were not allowed to be beat cops that it was very very rare for a a woman to be allowed to be a an officer of the law out in the field they they, they could be things like you know i forget what the the technical term but like you know a meter maid and they do like you know secretarial work it was it was actually a like a rare occurrence in the early 70s for that uh yeah it's it's wild to think about so there was a show called um 
what was it called? It wasn't called Lady Cop. It was Police Woman with Angie Dickinson, who was like, you know, like the sex symbol of the 70s. Uh, and it was just like the whole gimmick was just like a beautiful lady as a cop. And folks, it was a hit TV show. There wasn't much more to that. Yeah. Angie Dickinson. Um, DC tried it with Lady Cop. Lady Cop did not take off. I made an episode on comic tropes about it. It's a pretty weird book. It's a pretty weird book. It's really hung up on the idea of like, wow, can you even imagine? <laughs> we'll get back to the news. Uh, a former Marvel publisher as in that was his title, the, the publisher, uh, has started a new company. Uh, really, this is more about talking about a current Zoop crowdfunded project, but I'm going to tell you about like sort of the um, background on it. Uh, John Nee, he was the publisher at Marvel through 2020, fairly recent. And then he consulted at IDW for a little while uh, until very recently. And during that time, he met these guys. He te he's now teamed up with the former IDW editor-in-chief, John Barber, and the former IDW business manager, Nate Murray, to form a new company called Pug Worldwide. And Pug stands for something. I don't know. I forget what it stands for. It doesn't really matter. It, they call themselves Pug Worldwide. So here's, what, here's their first project. Conan the Barbarian Colossal Edition. So it's being crowdfunded on Zoop, like I mentioned. Uh, what it's going to have full 11 by 17 inch original art size scans of Conan pages uh, by look at some of these artists, Barry Windsor Smith, Jim Lee, John Buscema, Gil Kane, Neil Adams, Art Adams, huge names, all of them, beautiful, gorgeous, super talented artists. They call it the Colossal Edition. You get to like, I love looking at these sort of high-end books that are scans of the original art because you can see, you know, maybe the blue line or regular pencil um, roughs. Uh, you know, you can see the inking techniques. Uh, you can see sometimes patches or notes on the side that the artist had. It's an interesting look into the creative process, in my opinion, in my opinion. Mm. Also features a foreword by Roy Thomas. If you're not aware, Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith were the original creative team for the comic book version of Conan. And I really don't think you can overstate that while they didn't create Conan, I really think it was them who popularized it. And of course, then John Buscema stepping in as the next artist. A lot of people uh, prefer his slightly beefier take on um, Conan. It was some of his best art, no question, in his career. But Roy Thomas, huge, longtime writer of the comic. Um, yeah. And, and Conan is still, you know, huge in comics. Um, there was the, the one good Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. A lot of people don't really remember that there was also a second really bad Conan movie. Uh, Conan the Destroyer, uh, not so good. <laughs> not not something I'd recommend. Uh, so it's like you know, our, our, and and I think people um, that the first one, Conan the Barbarian, that was a hit movie, but it was also like like before Arnold really was Arnold. That and the original Terminator are part of what made Arnold Schwarzenegger popular. But it wasn't until he was doing movies like Commando and Predator that he started to sort of become a superstar. Um, so I really think that like, um, you know, uh, the, the comic is, is primarily what has made Conan so popular. Was Jason Momoa Conan? I think you're right. I think that they did make a Conan movie with Jason Momoa. I didn't see that. Right. Yeah, Arnold was in the Red Sonja movie, but he wasn't technically playing Conan. That also wasn't great, in my opinion. My opinion. Um, That's awesome. That's awesome that you knew it, 
uh, wait, you, I know Conan through the work of Ray Thomas long before I read any of the Howard stories. Same, same. Um, hey, Robert E. Howard definitely created Conan, but I think in terms of fleshing it out and, and making it a more, you know, popular character, I, I think Roy Thomas, Barry Windsor Smith, and John Buscema deserve a lot of the credit there. A lot. Yeah, Coney and the Destroyer was written by Roy Thomas. All I can say is that doesn't mean that it can translate into a good movie because in a movie, it's a lot of hands in the pot. And sometimes something great comes out of it and sometimes it's not so great. I, I like a lot of what Frank Miller was doing in the 80s and 90s, right? I really can't claim that Robocop 2 and 3, which were written by Frank Miller, are that great. Two is watchable, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the original one. Uh, the original Coney and the Barbarian is the one with James Earl Jones, and and he's like a really good villain in that. <laughs> the scene where he turns into a snake, fantastic. Oh, that's what we we all want. Anyway, uh, just thought I'd mention this one though. Uh, there's a lot of different versions of it that you can get, but if you're a fan of any of these artists. I thought you might be interested in that. Um, and it's got a good pedigree in terms of the people that are putting it together. A good pedigree. This is more of a manga story that I just wanted to mention. Um, this gentleman that you see here is a prolific editor uh, for Shuisha, specifically through their sh weekly Shonen Jump uh, books uh, and Shonen Jump Plus, I believe. It's worth noting that the editor in manga is typically very intimately involved with shaping the direction uh, for, for a comic and um, really giving serious feedback and, and more than advice, like, you know, sort of telling the, the, the writers and artists what they need to be doing to, to make it connect and, and to like have it make sense and, and go forward properly. Um, this is a very prolific uh, editor. Uh, name of Shihei Lin. Shihei Lin is an editor at Shonen Jump. Uh, lots of hit titles. He shared on Twitter this week uh, that he had been in the hospital ever since November 5th due to a blood vessel um, behind his right eye bursting. So that, that counts as a brain hemorrhage. It's a pretty serious thing. Uh, you don't want extra bleeding going on uh, up in here. Uh, that's what causes strokes and stuff. So, um, yeah, you got to be uh, on the lookout for that. So in this picture, you know, like it shows some of the stuff that he works on. Um, Spy Family. I love Spy Family. Chainsaw Man. I like Chainsaw Man. I don't love Chainsaw Man. I like it. But those are two hits that I think everybody's at least heard of. Yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder. Is he overworked? I don't know, but let me talk about how he sort of shared this stuff. He he posted on Twitter that he's recovering. That's great. That he plans on slowing down a little. That's great. He also apologized for being slow to respond to emails. And it's sort of like, you know what? When it's your life and it's your serious health, uh, I think it almost goes without saying that people understand that you have to slow down. But the Japanese do seem to have a very strong work ethic, or at least want to be perceived as having that strong work ethic, perceived by each other at work. Um, so yeah, he sort of apologized, uh, which I don't think was necessary as all. I, I just want this guy to recover uh, because I'm sure he's got an, a key role in the guidance of these ongoing stories. Some of the other stuff that he's managed, um, he's done like over a hundred titles. And of course, when we say that, keep in mind a lot of titles in Shonen Jump don't last that long necessarily. The readers vote every single week on what their top three favorites are. Those definitely get renewed. Um, and, 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 you know, like just because there's top three, then you're getting like hundreds and hundreds, if not probably thousands, maybe even millions of responses, probably just thousands but maybe hundreds of thousands of responses. And so they all get ranked. And the ones at the bottom go on the chopping block. You know, if all of a sudden all of the readers started like not voting for One Piece, 
it probably doesn't matter that it, it's gone for like, you know, 25 years. Like Shonen Jump would probably just be like, okay, tell you what, we'll give you like a couple one shots to wrap this up, but but it's cut. You know, like it, it, it can be ruthless. <laughs> um, but yeah, here's some of the other titles he's done that have been turned into successful anime. I haven't read these, so I'm not as familiar, but Hell's Paradise, uh, Jigu Kuraku and, Kuraku and Blue Exorcist. Oh, and Dan Dan Dan. Dan 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 is pretty popular. Yeah, exactly. Sorry I wasn't keeping up on my emails. <laughs> I had all this blood spraying out of my ears and eyes and stuff, so it slowed me down a little. My apologies. <laughs> Sumimasen! <laughs> Hell's Paradise is great. Nice. Blue Exorcist. That's a throwback. Anyway, well, then that gives you um, an idea of uh, how much this guy does. So anyway, I think that uh, even if we're not intimately familiar with uh, this gentleman, uh, that we all definitely wish him uh, good health and are grateful that it wasn't um, anything more serious. As long as I'm talking about manga stuff, here's an opportunity for people that draw in that manga style to theoretically get their foot in the door um now it's it's to win an the the, the right to have netflix make an anime uh, or animated show based on your creation but they need you to be the artist so like here's here's specifically what they're doing um netflix and world maker and world maker is basically like an app that can turn your drawings your storyboard drawings into rough animations okay Maybe rough is like, too, doesn't sound right, but but that's what it basically does. Um, so they've got this new contest that is now open for submissions through January 8th. Uh, entrants can submit storyboards for new ideas, and the winner is going to be developed into an anime. Okay. Uh, entries are required to be no longer than 10 minutes. Fair. Uh, the grand prize winner will also receive 500 thousand yen uh by the way that's just over three thousand dollars so uh you're not looking at a huge paycheck for winning this although i do think that you get some rights to this and you probably would share some royalties okay but anyway uh <laughs> uh there is no world that netflix doesn't take 100 percent ownership of your ip somehow in this i don't know i don't know it might not be for everybody I didn't read all the details. I ain't a lawyer. I ain't a lawyer. No, no, I don't have the time to submit, Wally, but thank you for asking. Um, uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily only in Japan. It is aimed at, at Japanese, and it's aimed at people that aren't professionals. But from what I looked at, there were no rules that excluded um, professionals or people from outside of Japan. I didn't see anything about that. But you probably would need to be able to um, communicate with people in, in Japanese. $3,000 is just about $1,000 less than I have in my bank account. So it would be a nice payday for me. It It's it's theoretically a way to get your foot in the door. If it, I, I Whether it's worth it to people, that's a personal decision. Yes, I agree that big companies typically take the lion's share of, of the profits and the rights. Hopefully we get to see something cool. Um, they're Netflix and Shonen Jump are going to uh, Shonen Jump plus technically uh, are going to announce the winners in March. So I did hear about that. A Terminator anime. Hey, um, they, they've failed to continue the movies. How many times now? Like the third one's kind of stunk the fourth one salvation i didn't like at all they did a fifth one genesis that was garbage um i guess you could sort of argue that the sixth one was okay the third and the sixth one were okay maybe um and they had that show sarah connor chronicles guess what i do recommend sarah connor chronicles that was a badass good show but yeah sure go with anime at this point Some Frank Frazetta comics are being held 
over uh, these allegations of creators not getting paid. So that's pretty serious. Two Terminator shows? I can only think of Sarah Connor Chronicles. I can't think of another Terminator show. Let me um, talk about uh, these comics. So we're talking about the um, uh, comics that are put out by Opus Publishing. They're licensed from the Frazetta estate based on his characters. And sometimes the covers will be um, Frank Frazetta paintings. Um, it's it's pretty deep, but it's actually not necessarily the worst. Okay, it's not good, but it's not the worst. I'll, let me get into it. So uh, first of all, this all started with German comic book creator Sadat Ozgen, I'm guessing, sorry, um, posting something to social media this week. He, he's been working on Frank Frazetta's science fantasy and covers for Frank Frazetta's Mothman, Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer, all of them published by Opus Comics. Okay. Um, he alleged on both Facebook and Instagram, and it was a really long post, so I'm just sort of summarizing it in a, in a sentence or two. But if you want, I, I recommend reading, you know, looking up Sadat Ozgen and, and seeing what he had to say. But he alleged that he has not been paid. Uh, the writer on one of the books that he works with, Aaron John Gregory, backed him up saying he was going to reach out because he also has not been paid and he wanted to know what his what, you know, is going on. For what it's worth, the Frazetta state stepped in and, and and it is not on them. So Sarah, it, it's on the comic book publisher that, that makes the comics. They've licensed this stuff to them. Uh, so, But Sarah Frazetta uh, had a long post explaining what they're going to do. They're going to halt all of their titles until they're sure that the people that are creating these have been paid. I think that's fair. Um, to anybody that's, you know, a huge fan of the comic, I'm sure it's frustrating if you have to like, you know, have a book go on hiatus, but I think we'd all agree that it's really important that these people get properly compensated for their work, which has already been performed. So, uh, yeah, that, that is what Sarah Frazetta, uh, is doing. And I think that's a good thing. And to be fair, Opus Comics also came out with a, a lengthy statement talking about this. Here's the gist of it. They explained that due to some supply chain issues here in the U.S. that were basically caused by, you know, the pandemic. And I think we all know that there are still supply chain issues on a lot of stuff. Paper, for instance, very expensive. Uh, lumber and stuff like that for building houses, very expensive right now still. Um, so they explained that, like, they had a U.S.-based branch that was overseeing the comics. They were dealing with these supply chain issues. They ran into some money um, issues and they, they've they ceased operations. The UK main branch has announced that they are taking over responsibility for everything and that they are going to make it right and make sure that all the creators get paid. That is their statement. It's not that they've made it happen yet. Um, at least they're not ducking anything that, you know, is a lengthy statement explaining what's going on and that they feel bad. And they do agree that, you know, the, the creators absolutely should be paid. And then they've, they've pledged that they will pay them. I hope that is the case. Um, yeah, I think Sarah, Sarah reacted very quickly to it, you know, like within 24 hours, she, she had like, you know, issued a statement of like, guess what? If they're not getting paid, you know, we're not, <laughs> We're not like allowing any more comics to come out until that gets uh, resolved. Good morning from Western Australia. How amazing. Well, uh, good evening from the United States. Never a good sign when a publisher is slow to pay creators. Nope. I think it is a, a cash flow issue. Um, that said, it is a bigger company than just something called Opus Comics. They're owned by a big record label, okay? Uh, something like Incendium. So there should be funds to make this right. Um, it sounds like a bunch of red tape happened, you know? They, they had a subsidiary uh, in another country that dealt with some serious issues, and they were the ones responsible for making the payments, but they just didn't have the funds. They, they ran out of money. Uh, the parent company is like, okay, you know, we tried to do this through a subsidiary. Guess we got to do it ourselves. I hope this all, all works out. I hope this all works out. Um, yeah. 
what else can I say? I hope it all works out. But I'm spreading the word so that there's some more accountability, right? Like there's more of us aware of what's going on with this situation. So if we hear any follow-up, we'll sort of know where things are. Uh, because sometimes it's the pressure of people, you know, either buying and not buying things and commenting on social media relentlessly that makes things happen, unfortunately. Uh, but I hope that these creators get paid soon because working in comics until, unless you're at the very top, you know, it can definitely be a thing where you're not in a position to float a, a few months bills. You know, you need to be paid for the work that you've done. Um, it's crazy. There were some comments by the Marvel's director reacting to the various um, sort of accusations or at least criticism online about the Marvels being a quote unquote woke movie, which is obviously a very nebulous term, uh, very nebulous. But let, let's let's make a little sense of what was what's going on. So the Marvels, uh, these are just facts. First of all, it debuted to. Well, I said the lowest ticket sales for an MCU movie. It may be second lowest. I think that The Incredible Hulk, and that's going back to like, what, 2008. That might have had, oh no, you know what it is? The Incredible Hulk had a lower first day, but the Marvels has a lower weekend. Yikes. But there's obviously some contributing factors to where things are in movies right now. Uh, let me pause to acknowledge this. Thank you, John Dorsey, for the super chat. Watching my Broncos. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm I'm competing with Monday Night Football this time of year. Uh, but can't resist the ball of the best comics live stream on YouTube. And the assorted delights of the tropes verse. Hope you and the lady are well, Chris. Lifetime fan. Thank you, John. I'm well. Chrissy's well. Our cats are well. We're doing good. We're doing good. It does seem to be to, to me a meaningless phrase. I think it's just too broad for what what you know people that use it uh, mean. It, it's like anything that they don't like. You know, they, they could look at IKEA instructions and get confused, and they go, "These are woke." <laughs> you know, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like. <laughs> um, Marvel's biggest box office for Black woman director. I hadn't gotten to that, but I do have that there, Steve. Yes, there, there are some some factors here. So um, it, it went over 100 million uh, worldwide for the weekend, but only 47 million here in the U.S. That's not huge. It's not tiny, it, just to be clear. It's not tiny, but it is for comparing against most MCU projects. It's not a great sign because what was the last one? Um, Quantumania, Ant-Man 3. And that didn't that did a lot of money, but it didn't turn a profit because they spent way too much. Um, but to be clear, director Nia DaCosta still has set a record here for the largest opening weekend for a movie directed by a black woman. That's, that's not nothing, you know, uh, what's the name of her first movie? I'm forgetting right now. I liked her Candyman sequel, uh, slash reboot. I should have put reboot. It was, it was really a sequel. I liked her Candyman movie actually, but she did a movie before that, uh, with Tessa Thompson, you know, who plays Valkyrie and I'm, I'm totally blanking on the name of it, but it's a good drama. Oh, well it, it, whatever she, she's talented. Okay. She's talented. Um, I am having trouble with the, uh, battery on this, um, camera. I'm going to get another one ready while I talk. Um, what was I going to say? So, um, it didn't do well. We're, at least it, we'll say that it didn't perform to Marvel Studios hopes. That's probably the most accurate way to say this. Okay. Uh, it didn't perform to Marvel Studios hopes. Uh, I, again, I, I said at the top of the show, I really liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, there's a couple things that interfered here. First of all, uh, box offices everywhere are way down as soon as the pandemic hit, you know, like guaranteed hits in the past would have been things like, you know, a fast and the furious movie, maybe even the flash with all of its controversy, you know, as long as it was like a big budget thing, you kind of could count on these things, making a certain amount of, of profit. And, um, people just aren't willing to go to the movie theaters as much anymore. It doesn't help that the timeline between for, for waiting for it to hit, you know, 
at least video on demand, if not like Blu-ray and stuff like that, is very small these days. Like the, you don't have to be super patient. If you don't want to go to a movie theater, you'll be able to see the Marvels on Disney Plus in what, like two months or something like that? Something close to that. Um, and then also uh, there has been until like a couple days ago, uh, an actor's strike. So the actors are literally not allowed to promote their current projects or they would be in violation of their union rules and then you don't get benefits and stuff like that and you might not get work. So, you know, Brie Larson, until a couple of days ago, you know, she couldn't go on like late night talk shows to promote her stuff. That was just, that that hurts. Like, you know, you you people people need more than commercials to know that a movie is out there and to get excited. And that really is the things like the late night talk shows, the morning news shows, Sometimes going on like YouTube shows, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. <sighs> Immunocompromised, I can't see it in theaters and would have otherwise. Totally fair. Totally fair uh, concern. I'm just saying that there are things like, you know, yes, there are still movies that are hits. But I think if we look at like, you know, big budget stuff, it's not as big a hit as it used to be. Thank you, Michael Johnson Curry, for the super chat. Biggest issue is marketing. Barbie broke records during strike and post-pandemic. Plus, Barbie was great. It, it did. You know, there's a couple things, though. First of all, Barbie didn't cost as much. So that's smart. Uh, I think that studios need to find a way to make more um, small and, and mid-budget movies. Uh, but um, it also caught a wave of you know, a, a really once in a lifetime sort of groundswell based on that idea of Barbenheimer that like people like legit were just amused at like two wildly different movies coming out at the same time. And both of those movies did well. I think if, if they had been separated by a couple months that that would have hurt both of those movies. Like there wouldn't have been that same sort of awareness of people talking about this on social media. The, the, yeah, meme culture helped those movies, uh, which is, and, and they deserve, those are both really good movies. I'm sure that they're both going to be in my top 10 movies of this past year. No question, really. No question. They, they, they are. And the Marvels is not going to be. Um, That's fair. Yeah, I saw the creator and it was an interesting movie, but it still flopped. You know, like a lot of these movies just aren't doing well. Like, wasn't it? Wasn't it this year that like a Fast and Furious movie came out in the summer and that kind of flopped? Uh, anyway, um, boy, am I get am I getting sidetracked with uh, just talking about like the the state of movies? Uh, we'll get back to to the actual topic here. So the director Nia DaCosta spoke with Variety, trade pub publication about. Um, film and TV and stuff like that, uh, speaking, speaking about sort of the woke criticism. Here was her, her comments uh, in quotes. There are pockets where you go because you're like, I'm a super fan. I want to exist in the space of just adoration, which includes civilized critique. Uh, she also said, then there are pockets that are really virulent and violent and racist and sexist and homophobic and all those awful things. And I choose the side of the light. That's the part of the fandom I'm most attracted to. Um, I think all of us would probably say that. Are all of us, uh, you know, going to follow that? I don't know. Yeah, these, you guys are putting out um, a, a bunch of good things. You're right. Black Adam kind of flopped. Mission Impossible drastically underperformed. Mission Impossible. I mean, when does a Tom Cruise move, uh, Tom Cruise movie underperform? Because uh, it was a pretty good movie, honestly. As far as Mission Impossible goes, it was it was fun. It was fun. It didn't do well. And the Marvels um, probably isn't going to do well after this opening box office. The only thing that might help is it is getting good word of mouth overall. If you go to something like Rotten Tomatoes, the overall um, uh, viewers uh, score was like, I think, 86% the last time I checked. Pretty good. I liked it. I liked it. Um, but not everybody did. Uh, adding a little, oh, adding a like to help the stream. Thank you, Michael DeFonte. Thank you so much. I know I love Mutant Mayhem. It's so crazy how some of these uh, movies just aren't doing that well. Um, so 
Uh, <laughs> oh, hell, gozaimasu. <laughs> uh, let's see. D&D &D made back its budget via home media. D&D &D was a really good movie. That was one of the better movies this season. As far as like a, um, you know, big tentpole action adventure movie, Dungeons and Dragons was one of the most fun. And, and, it, and, it, but it didn't do that great. It, it did okay. It did okay. So, you know, you can pick and choose your facts here. You know, you could say like the Marvels bombed and that's not, that's not inaccurate. That's not inaccurate, but I don't know if it's fair to say that it's because of who's in the movie or, or, or something like that, you know, um, because a lot of movies are not doing well. Just something worth um, mentioning. I think you have to be very specific with why something doesn't do well. Um, I think the promotion was a huge element of this one. Uh, I, I think it could have performed a lot better. Uh, and I and I do think it's a good movie for what it's worth. I don't think it's a great movie. I'm not saying that. I think it's an entertaining movie. I love going to the movie theater, so I'm I'm a little also biased. I like this stuff. Hmm. Bear with me. I'm going to do something here and um, I'm nervous about my uh, charging on the camera. So I'm going to switch some cords around here real quick and I'll take this off so that you're not just staring at something that we're not talking about anymore. And I'll be right with everybody. I just want to... Uh, be sure that the camera doesn't die while I'm doing a live stream, you know? So how many people in this chat actually went and saw it, by the way? Like, only let me know if you actually went and saw it, because I'm going to guess not a lot, but you never know. You never know. going to put a different camera up here and try to switch over in a sec. Okay. Miguel says went Friday. Chemdog went Friday. Um, Crichton says I got spoiled on the post credit scene. I'm not talking about any of that. I don't want to spoil it for you guys. All I'll say is all the post credit stuff was great. It was really cool. Oh, by the way, you know, while it, it's not really talking directly about the, 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 like anything that would be a spoiler, but, um, the, uh, the movie does pull together a bunch of the stuff that it, Marvel's been putting out in like their shows and movies lately. It finally brings a bunch of that together, which I kind of thought was good, but, uh, let's see, I'm going to having trouble getting the camera there to aim. Let me go into my settings here. And I'm going to swap this out. Ha. Huh. Uh, okay. So that's obviously not as vibrant or anything like that. But the other camera is about to die. So I had to swap it. Sorry. Nothing I can do. Um, I'll be more prepared next week. Yeah, it's just not getting a charge. I need to get an. I, I use my phone for the main camera, and uh, it's it's dying. I need to get a new phone. Lord Overlord saw it. Uh, S Train saw it. Francisco saw it. Um, Pensacor says it bombed because people don't trust the MCU. Maybe. I mean, that doesn't help. You're right that it, it, it doesn't help that like uh, we're at a point where the last few um, movies haven't been spectacular. So people get like nervous. But I don't know that it's completely broken. I think like a really good. I mean, wait a minute, because because Guardians of the Galaxy three was really, really good. So I don't know. It's and you know what? Like even during um, phase one and phase two, we you know, I, I can't claim that Iron Man 2, The Incredible Hulk, Thor 2. None of those were really 
better than say the Marvels. I don't, I don't think so. I would say instead that they all were building towards the Avengers and you got that feeling. So it felt like it was worth seeing because it was building to something else and you didn't want to, there was fear of missing out. I think that the Marvel movies need to add that back in. Boy, this camera is really bad. Actually. Do I have any way to seeing if there's anything I can do to, um, get, get my main camera charging. Oh, okay. Hold on. I might've, I might've resolved the problem. I might, this is, uh, I know a terrible lull in the show. If you're watching it, um, live uh, or recorded, but I'm going to put in a new, I think I've got the better camera charging properly now. The camera's very artsy. It stinks. It's terrible. Let me get it back into my settings. I think... There. I think that looks better. And I think it's charging properly now. Let me just double check. Yeah. I think I'm okay there. I think I'm okay. Thanks, everybody. Let's get back into the news. That was a, that was a terrible uh, uh, way to do the show. We'll keep moving. DC announced uh, some of the events, not events, events has a weird connotation now, doesn't it? Uh, some of the upcoming story arcs uh, in their comics, and some of these sounded pretty interesting. Uh, they called it the Trinity of Evil. <laughs> uh, this was just one of their uh, press releases. So yeah, they called their three stories the Trinity of Evil. We've got, uh, in Batman, we've got the Batman of Zur and R, Batman's weirdo backup personality continuing to undermine Batman and cause trouble. That's in the Chip Zdarsky, um, Jorge Jimenez main title. We've got, uh, Titans beast world tour metropolis. Well, that's a mouthful of a title. Uh, and, uh, in that one, heroes and villains are both being turned into animal versions of themselves causing chaos uh, Amanda Waller and Dreamer are teaming up to form a new version of Task Force X to battle it. Okay. And in the stuff that's um, by Joshua Williamson and, um, oh shoot, why didn't I write this artist's first name? Because now I'm blanking on it. Um, last name Sandoval. They're doing a story in action comics where Superman is going to go up against the Brainiac Queen. <laughs> Will the zoo crew appear? Yeah, absolutely. No question. No question. Uh, so Zurinar is evil now. I wouldn't say evil so much as misguided and potentially like, you know, not focused the way Batman is. It's hard. To, is it Rafa? Ravi? I'll take you guys' word on it. I don't remember off the top of my head. Anyway. Sounded like some fun ideas. And I wanted to seed that because the next piece of news follows up on that. So DC has announced they've, they're they going to have a new Suicide Squad comic. Okay, fair enough. What's the, what's the angle on this one? What's the angle on this one? Um, spinning out of Action Comics issue 1060 and the Titans Beast World Tour Metropolis comes a new Suicide Squad series. It's called Suicide Squad Dream Team. It's going to be co-written by Steve Orlando with Nicole Maines, the actress who played Dreamer on the show Supergirl. Uh, art by Fico Osio. So I think it was a couple weeks ago we talked about how Nicole Maines was writing a young adults graphic novel about Dreamer. She will now be writing, or co-writing I should say, uh, the character in an ongoing comic book uh interesting uh she's really uh it, it's kind of lovely to see somebody this passionate about a character that they played I'll, I'll say that uh this debuts in march and so there's uh some some preview page art uh we see amanda waller looking at her phone we've got all these images of dreamer i i don't know i don't know what it is but uh yeah I know someone who went to college with Steve Orlando. Ooh. Everybody can relax. No one is here. 
Uh, let's see. Care Bear says, I'd actually like to see the Suicide Squad go up against the Secret Six. I like that idea a lot. That's a really cool idea. Why would Amanda Waller recruit Dreamer and not John Kent? Well, I guess we'd have to read the book to know. I don't know. There's probably a reason for it. So we'll see. Dreamer is just like a hero, right? Surely she wouldn't willingly work with Waller, but I guess Waller can always blackmail. Hey, um, Suicide Squad uh, has a long history of heroes working alongside the villains um, and villains moving towards becoming the heroes as well. You know, Bronze Tiger was definitely more of a villain originally, became eventually more of a hero, joined the Justice League at one point, if I remember right. Um, there have been heroes that, I mean, Rick Flagg is flat out a good guy and, and, and he works for uh, um, the Suicide Squad. So there are reasons. There are reasons. Sometimes they've just got a particular skill that, you know, Waller feels the need to, to get, and she will get it either through offering the carrot or the stick. She is, um, there was a period where I think that people sort of felt that Amanda Waller was just, you know, more of a neutral, if not good, but Amanda Waller was definitely created as sort of a villain. She, she's pretty manipulative. She, she's not a great person. Yes. Yes. And it, that was pre-crisis, but yes, Bronze Tiger did kill Batwoman. Batwoman hadn't been in the comics for like decades. And they brought her back just to kill her off. It was kind of stinky, but yeah. Bronze Tiger is a good guy now, but he was a villain originally. I also like the concept of Amanda Waller. I think that she, she's interesting. Moving on, uh, DC has delayed a book again. This is the cover for uh, Superman, The Last Days of Lex Luthor, issue two. So the second issue of this book was last announced to arrive in December. We're almost there. Uh, DC has now updated its release schedule for its comics through February 24th. It is no longer anywhere in there. So it's going to be a while until we get that. When did issue one come out? Uh, yeah, that was all the way back in July. That was back in July that, that DC released that. But Brian Hitch went on social media and was like, yeah, DC released that way earlier than I expected them to. He's like, I've got a lot of commitments right now. You know, there was no way I was going to be able to finish like this limited series once they like released that in July. He does not understand why DC decided to do it that way. Um, you know, it's coming. It's coming, but it's not coming anytime soon. We don't know when it's going to come. But think all the way through February. That means the earliest it's going to come out. The absolute earliest is like March. And the first issue was July. July all the way to the next March. Whew. It'll read better in trade. So the story, if you're curious, does involve a dying Lex Luthor, and he enlists the Man of Steel to find a cure for a mysterious illness. Uh, despite the crime, Superman puts their differences aside, and he embarks on a journey through space and time to save his longtime enemy. That's Superman for you. He's going to do the right thing if he's able to. He's going to do the right thing. Presumably the last days before he dies... Yeah, it's self-contained. It's not an ongoing monthly title. So I think it's only supposed to be three issues. So it's just going to be one of these books that takes a while to come out. I I don't know if it's quite as bad as the Miracle Man delays. You know, like I, I it hasn't quite been 20 years. It hasn't quite been 20 years. <laughs> but also, I don't think it's this is very different than like, you know, sometimes when artists and writers are very slow to produce stuff. I mean, Brian Hitch is working on a lot of things right now. Um, you know, he's been doing a bunch of the ultimate stuff. Uh, he did ultimate invasion, right. Uh, and he's doing, um, venom and he's doing a bunch of covers. Uh, the guy's busy. The guy's busy. They, DC should have just waited. A reverse all-star Superman. Sort of. I mean, it, Mark Wade and Brian Hitch, I think, are worth waiting for. By the way, folks, note that this is a black label title. That 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 
That doesn't necessarily mean Elseworlds, but it also doesn't necessarily mean the main ongoing continuity for what it's worth. You know, it could be its own separate story like Superman Space Age recently, which was great. I wanted to get these covers, I think. But maybe it's just as well that they haven't come out yet because, they, boy, are they expensive. I am talking about a variant cover made for the Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong comic, of which uh, I did say that the first issue was not that great. But this is an interesting variant. So, originally, issue one was meant to be published, well, a variant was, with a voice chip. Uh, one would have Godzilla's, you know, ski ronk roar. One would have King Kong's, you know, uh, Godzilla roar. That sounds kind of fun. If they can put it in Hallmark cards, they should be able to put it in comics, right? But production issues delayed them to originally, they were saying they were going to come out the 28th of November. Well, that's pretty close. Uh, now, they're just announced as being further delayed. No current release day. So are they happening? I don't know. I hope so. But they they will cost $14.99 when it comes out. That's a big price increase. That's three times the cost of like the comic for that sound. Uh, is that a good value? No, probably not. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Can I do the Godzilla roar? No, I don't think I can. I was trying to think of even how to approach it, and I don't think I could. Uh, super gimmicky. But I do love Godzilla's sound. You know, that that's pretty iconic. So we'll see. Yeah, $14.99 American. <laughs> 15 bucks for a Hallmark card. Yeah, it, <laughs> that's a spicy meatball. It is not cheap. Ski -ronk. Oh, you know what? I don't have it here in the news, but as long as I'm mentioning Godzilla, there is Godzilla Comics news, so I'll just uh, focus on me. I forgot to put it in there. Marvel uh, got the rights to reprint their Godzilla run. Yes, uh, I made an episode about it on Comic Tropes. It is a bizarre take on Godzilla, but they did a year-long 12-issue series where Godzilla... Goes across America. He he lands in like San Francisco and he just tears across the country till he eventually gets to New York and fights all the superheroes. You know, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, the champions. He fights all of them. It's uh, it's pretty cool, to be honest. It's it's weird. Uh, Herb Trimpey did the art and his his take on Godzilla, his his interpretation of drawing him is. Uh, is different. You know, it's not, it's not on model. It, 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 he's a big giant, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex green lizard thing. Uh, but it's still recognizably Godzilla written by Doug Mensch. Great writer. You know, he was doing Shang-Chi and Moon Knight and stuff then. Um, yeah. So uh, they are reprinting that. And as a trade paperback, uh, a, a Godzilla omnibus. Marvel seems to have been doing a bunch of licensing deals lately to to be able to reprint some of this stuff you know they've got rom coming back uh you know reprints but like rom and uh micronauts and now godzilla so all their big stuff that was licensed in the 70s they're 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 bringing back uh anyway yep yep they introduced the the mecha red ronin in it and by the way technically that version of Godzilla does still exist in the Marvel Universe. This, this evil supervillain in it is called Dr. Demonicus, and he mutated Godzilla into looking different, and they, they call him something else. But that monster still exists in the Marvel Universe. I think he showed up in an issue of West Coast Avengers back in the 90s, if I'm remembering right. But yeah, I don't know about that. We are getting a collected ROM. We are. Yeah. They announced, Marvel announced that they are, they, they uh, I think in 2024, we're getting an omnibus or a couple omnibuses. So yeah. An oversized hardcover. Very cool. Nice to see you out of Voida. So yeah, could be fun. 
How long until they reprint the Shogun Warriors comic? I think that of the licensed things, that's probably the one that like people would know the least about. Ramen Micronauts have like probably retained a little bit more pop culture uh, memories than that one. Yeah, uh, I have uh, Jack Kirby's 2001 adaptation and his ongoing comic series. Uh, that would be cool if they brought back. Probably not likely, but who knows? Who knows? Mm, didn't have any uh, plans to talk about petrol head. Sorry. Uh, let me get back to wrapping up the news, and then we'll talk about some of the comics that came out this week. Uh, MCU, the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, since they got past, they being Hollywood, since Hollywood got past the actors' strike, that means that they know that they're moving forward now. And instead of just coming up with like a release date that could have had to shift again, they've now been able to say like, here's when their movies are coming out. And um, it's shifted back pretty far, just to be clear. So first of all, um, th this is talking about 2024 and 2025. Okay. So first of all, 2024 is only going to have one MCU movie for the whole year. Deadpool 3. Uh, that's coming out July 26th of 2024 now. But that's going to be the only official MCU movie that in, in all of 2024. Everything else got pushed back. Uh, Captain America Brave New World. That's going to come out February 14th of 25. The Thunderbolts in July. July 25th of 2025. Blade is being pushed all the way to November 7th, 2025. And you know what? I'm fine with all of this stuff getting delayed. It'll hopefully give them more time to get everything done the best it can be. I hope. I hope. Uh, Fantastic Four is still set for what was last announced to be its release date, which is May 2nd of 2025. That does mean that in 2025, there will be four MCU movies. 2023, one. Uh, 2025, four. It's kind of a lot. Uh, finally, just worth noting, Sony is releasing three of their sort of Spider-Man type movies in 2024. So we will sort of still get some Marvel stuff. Uh, let's see. I'll do it more in order. Madam Web comes out February 14th. Uh, Craven, August 30th. Venom 3 is set for November 8th. Uh, and DC, the only thing they're releasing in 2024 is uh, Joker 2, you know? So we'll see. We will see. Fine with them taking a bake. Yep. Um, testing the superhero fatigue idea to a degree. Uh, to a degree. I think that the most Marvel should be putting out the most is three and ideally probably only two. Um, but I'd also sort of say that every like three years, there should probably be some sort of a team up movie that lets us remember a character that might not get a sequel imminently. You know, like I want to see Shang-Chi or Blade or something if I like those characters. Uh, so that's, I think, I think that they should have sort of an Avengers or a Champions or a Defenders type of movie uh, every three years or so and, and like bring in some of those characters, even if it's a small cameo, just to sort of go like, no, they're still out there. Something like that. I don't know. That's what I would do, but it's who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Comics journalist Joe Sacco. Incredible creator. He's going to receive an honorary degree. I don't know how many of you out there have read Joe Sacco's work. Uh, great creator. Great creator. A lot of his stuff has been published through Fantagraphics, or at least primarily. Let's talk about that. So he's... He's a cartoonist, but he's also a journalist in a lot of ways because he talks about real life stuff in his comics. Um, he's going to receive an honorary degree um, very soon, four days from now, November 17th. So it's he, he's getting a doctor of literature degree by the Faculty of Arts of the University of Malta. 
And uh, Malta is, uh, you know, uh, size-wise, a relatively small nation. But Joe Sacco is a Maltese American. Uh, he was born in Malta, raised in the U.S. So it does make sense that um, their university would honor him for his work. It, do, it makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, yeah, I, I noted that. Uh, 1993, since then, he's been making comics, nonfiction comics, that explain what's going on in war zones and conflict zones. Um, stuff like in 93, he did a book about Palestine. Uh, he did a book about Gaza. He's done books about Bosnia, uh, Iraq. Very interesting stuff. Very serious stuff. But, very, you know, helps helps you understand. I, I love reading nonfiction in comics. Um, you know, this the, the, the books about Palestine and Gaza were stuff that was made like in the 90s into the early 2000s. So it's um, it's obviously super relevant right now to try to understand uh, those cultures and the underlying conflicts. Uh, and I'm not trying to take us down a rabbit hole where we talk about the current news because it's just way too depressing. I'm not even going to get into it. It's just too depressing. But I do recommend his books. They're quite interesting. You know, I mean, we're talking about life and death, real world stuff. And it, but it helps, you know, he, he really applies a journalistic integrity. He went to college uh, in, I think, Oregon to study journalism. Um, good artist, really, really has, um, I don't know, just like a really grounded, uh, you know, base in his in his approach. But but he finds uh, the human interest within it that something relatable and 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 talks about the conflicts. Really, really cool. Really, really cool. Uh, Joyce Brabner, sure. Joyce Brabner, yep. Oh, Joe, Joe in, in fact, since you mentioned that, like, um, Joe Sacco also did do some of our Harvey Picard's comics, um, American Splendor, you know, like illustrating Harvey Picard's story. So he's had a unique career. Oh, yeah, I've read Persepolis. It's fantastic. Fantastic. He's a real life Cordo Maltese. Kind of, kind of, yeah. Uh, I saw Sacco speak at the University of Oregon like a million years ago. So it was the University of Oregon that he went to. Got it. Yeah, it had to be. Yeah, I'd prioritize uh, reading it. I think you could get something out of it. Anyway, just thought I'd uh, acknowledge that. Good for Joe Sacco. Um, that's really nice to see him getting uh, such a nice degree. Jeff Lemire has vowed he's never going to work in TV again. Why is that? Well, First of all, writer and artist uh, Jeff Lemire has had his work adapted into TV before. For instance, uh, Sweet Tooth at Netflix. That's a pretty uh, successful adaptation of something he wrote. Uh, he was speaking this past weekend at the UK convention Thought Bubble about how stressful the TV adaptation of his work uh, Essex County has been. It doesn't sound fun for him. So uh, if you haven't read it, Essex County is a trilogy of uh, graphic novels. It's based on his life experiences growing up in Essex, uh, Canada. And uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, the, you know, the main channel in, in Canada, uh, licensed it to adapt it into TV. But it has taken a long time. Uh, so something uh, Lemire said at the convention this past weekend, quote, Originally, I wasn't going to be involved at all. I was going to be very hands off. Uh, but he said that basically they did like some sort of a pilot or something. And he was like, it doesn't feel right. It's 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 not accurate. Like, it, And so he uh, he stepped in and became the showrunner. Uh, so another quote by by Lemire. We didn't have the whole series written when we got greenlit. We were writing all the way up to shooting. We were just kind of manically writing and rewriting. Shooting was really stressful because we were a small production. We never had enough money. Uh, and then he said that returning to comics after that was a relief and that he will never work in TV again. Good for him. Uh. 
pretty sure Joe Sacco did do some stuff with Harvey Picard. Do, do I not have that right? Let me just uh, do a quick Google search. Yeah. I'm seeing... Yeah, yeah. Joe Sacco did do a little bit with uh, Harvey Picard. I've got that right. Yep, just wanted to double check. Anyway, that is a decision I can respect. Oh, well, just to be clear, his stuff can still be adapted. He's saying he doesn't have any interest in being the one that's like, you know, overseeing it all, that he preferred to just write comics. And that's totally understandable. <laughs> We're almost done. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Miller had an interesting idea for, you know, he he's always, by the way, posting ideas on how he thinks the industry could do better. And I don't always agree with all of them. For, for instance, um, I think he was saying something not too long ago that like, you know, um, Marvel and DC should be getting guys like um, Joss Whedon and John Byrne again. And I was like, that sounds like a big step back. I, I could be misremembering the, the exact creators. I thought that those were the two he mentioned. Um, but he also has an idea that, you know, when when Marvel and DC do well, uh, the entire industry does well. And I think that there is a big part of truth to that. And I think that this idea was pretty interesting. This is This all comes from a series of tweets he did this week. So let's talk through it. Uh, he says... I don't have any skin in the game as I've worked elsewhere for a long time, but I've got a lot of pals at Marvel and DC and hate to see them struggling like this. I offer this advice in good faith in a bid to help supercharge both freelance deals and the corporations themselves. It's this, this continues his, his writing. Uh, this is all a quote from Mark Miller. And if you guys don't know, I mean, Mark Miller's written, Tons of stuff that it's pretty well known, uh, especially for its adaptations. Um, what uh, the Kingsman, uh, Old Man Logan. Um, where, where do I even like begin? There's just so many uh, kick-ass. Tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. Um, it's crass to talk money, but it's also shocking that the people writing and drawing the top books are earning a fraction of what my peers and I earned on those titles 15 years ago. I made $1,000 a page plus royalties, but I'm hearing from guys on $90 a page and that's criminal. I'd love to see that cited, but you know, it's not his place, I guess, to say what somebody else said they're making. Uh, now the comic market has collapsed in the past five years and these companies have less money to pay staff and freelancers. But what I'm proposing is really simple economics and could massively help them both get in the black again. Are you ready? And I think you're all ready. Uh, they don't have the money at the moment to jack up their page rates, but it would cost them literally zero if they revolutionized their royalty deals. For example, right now, both companies typically pay around 2% royalty on all sales over, broadly speaking, 50,000 sales. I mean, 50,000 units. Given that just a handful of Marvel and DC books sell over 50,000 copies a month, this means almost no royalties are paid out. The number is almost abstract, and as sales decline, this seems to be a race to the bottom in terms of talent they can afford. These are very valid concerns. These are valid concerns. I think that definitely there was a period where people could get paid stuff like that. Yeah, I think that there probably was. I, I believe him there. Um, let me complete his, his, his idea here. My suggestion is that if one of these companies swaps that 2% royalty for a 50-50 split with the creative team on all sales over, say, 60,000 copies, they will send a bolt of electricity through the industry and bring in the most commercial freelancers in the biz again attracting top talent, but it would be absolutely dwarfed. Uh, wait, I skipped, didn't I? Uh, buh, buh, buh. A creator can make decent money on even a modestly selling creator-owned book, 
but it would be absolutely dwarfed by a 50% split on X-Men or Spider-Man with sales taken into the stratosphere. They could make literally millions per year for both company and talent. The beauty of this is that it would cost the big two nothing as it's zero fiscal outlay up front. It's just talking about royalties. The devil win is that they're getting 50% of a potentially huge number instead of a spiral to the depths where they are right now. I don't agree with all of his analysis here, but it is an intriguing idea to massively up the royalty rates. Some of the trick there is that 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 would bring the top talent, first of all. Of course it would. Big paydays are going to bring, bring the best talent, and they could like get a lot of those sort of mid-tier books, you know, like, I don't know. You get um, a really popular artist like I, I who's 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 like super popular con consistently i don't know we'll just say like you know guys like uh greg capullo or daniel warren johnson or who, who are some newer artists that i should be listing I, i'm trying to look i don't know um leonardo romero i i don't know maybe even get people for, from manga for all i know you detract them does that mean that because there's more talent that that would increase sales that much or is there still sort of a cap on sales until we can get distribution figured out right you know just because you have the best artist in the business on the superman title is that going to raise it up to like 500,000 sales a month or was that going to take some time figuring out a few other elements of the equation that's my that's my biggest concern here, is that there are other factors. Um, right, yeah, good good point. Um, Sean Murphy, Jason Fabok, Ryan Stegman, Tatsuki Fujimoto, Dan Mora, great one. It's a good it, it's it's not a bad idea in a lot of ways. I don't know if you even need to jump straight from 2% to a 50-50 split per se, you know, like what, but let's ratchet it up. Let's ratchet up the, I agree. You're not paying them more up front. Let's ratchet up those royalties. It's not a bad idea in that regard. I, I agree with him fundamentally on the idea of let's ratchet up the royalty rate and that can potentially uh, incentivize these creators to want it to sell better. But how do you incentivize the people that own these companies? How do you incentivize a Disney or a Discovery to want to invest the resources to get these comics, you know, into more outlets than just the comic book store so that you can potentially raise the units? raise the income, and, and maybe even bring down the costs of the individual issues. How do you do that? You can motivate the creators to do their best work, and that can increase some of the sales. But is that potentially just sort of eating at the existing base? You know, like, is that just gobbling up some of the lower titles and making those go away, and there's more at the top? Is it is it just building way more at the top and, and sort of getting rid of a bunch of the, the middle stuff because the smaller like self-published stuff will always have its sort of niche, but loyal audience. I don't know. Um, it's, I just thought it was worth um, talking about a little bit. I, I think that he's got a big idea here that he's right. There's no, there's no big financial risk here necessarily. Uh, at least up front. Um, it's, it's, I just think that there are potentially a few more elements to the equation than just getting the best people to create really captivating books. I think you need to figure out ways that you could like get these monthly comics at an affordable price at, you know, your Barnes and Nobles and your targets and your Walmarts. I don't know if it makes sense to put them in a grocery store anymore. I don't like think of how, because now they're competing for shelf space at that point with, you know, your, your 
Time magazines and your entertainment weeklies and stuff that always sell. I don't know. Yes, he is. He's saying like the profits of books over, say, 60,000 copies, the profits would get split 50-50 instead of just getting 2% of that profit uh, over a certain amount. Uh, so it, it, there's a there's there's a logic to it. I'm not against it at all. I just don't know if it solves the entire problem. But there is a, a good logic to it if you want to like build up certain titles. And maybe that does bring a bunch of people back to the industry. Maybe that does. I don't know. <sighs> it's tricky. I, I don't know what people buy for magazines, to be honest. Uh, I feel like those are just some ones that I've, I still see on the news racks, but I don't really know. There are magazines that still sell well. I just don't know off the top of my head what they are. I agree with you. The Comics Code Authority did stunt American growth uh, in comics because they kept it all aimed at kids for more than a full generation. Whereas in Europe and Japan... They were making comics uh, aimed at adults. You know, I just made an episode not long ago about Osamu Tezuka and how he got inspired to make story manga comics aimed at older audiences. And it got them invested and it got them reading and there was no stigma. But like for, for over a generation here in the United States, we had a self-censoring system that was keeping all these comics aimed at young readers. Comics is a medium. It could be aimed at anybody. You just need stories that appeal to different people. I mean, if you go to a bookstore, there's books aimed at everybody. That could be comics, but we, we're dealing, we, it's going to take a long time to get past that. It's going to take a long time. We'll see. Yes, Cartoons Magazine. That sounds like a good one. Yeah. Not only did they keep it aimed at kids, it almost decimated every genre that wasn't superheroes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, like these comics, um, you know, like romance, Western, horror, sci-fi, some of it was still made, but it was all aimed at kids. Whereas those are genres that could have appealed to adults and continued to appeal to adults. Um, in, the early, in the early 50s, coming out of World War II, Audiences were aging up because comics were still new, right? Comics had started like late 30s. Audiences were aging up and it was okay to have some of the comics aimed at kids, like a Superman or a Batman. It was okay to like all of a sudden Jack Kirby was coming up with the romance comics genre. And that was appealing to older people. Um, not old people, but older, older audiences. Uh, all of a sudden you had your books like um, the EC horror comics and the EC sci-fi comics, some of the best artists and writers in the business at the time. And that was appealing to an older audience. And we could have kept doing that. That's what they did in Japan. That's what they did in France. That's what they did in Italy. That's what they did in England. That's what they did in like Argentina. Not here, not here. The only place in the world where we imposed a self-censorship thing because we were so scared of communism that like we just implemented like all this self-censoring stuff. No other, uh, it didn't hit movies or TV the same way. It didn't hit radio the same way. It didn't hit magazines or books. It hit comics. It's really, really tough to look back at. It's really tough. We can't get past it. I truly believe that. I, I, I sincerely think that nowadays when you see, you know, like how well like a manga sells, it's reaching new audiences that don't necessarily pick up the latest comic. But you get somebody really into this and now they want more and more stories. I do think that they'll switch over and start reading more stuff here. I, I, I think it's good for the industry that, that, that manga sells so well. I really do. Let me wrap up with one last piece of news. This is a rumor which uh, comes from... Bleeding Cool. Rich Johnston of Bleeding Cool was at that uh, Thought Bubble comics convention this past weekend, and he reports on a rumor that he heard. So this isn't substantiated, but it's interesting. Here's his quote, okay? This comes from BleedingCool.com. I want to give them um, credit for this. Uh, DC Comics is looking to bring back the Vertigo line. The black label line is generally for short-run comics, but Vertigo, which will encompass the Sandman Presents line, 
will include ongoing series. Right now, they are just talking about DC Comics characters and IP treatments, but there is talk about returning to the creator-owned sphere for long-running titles. Stuff like uh, we used to have with, uh, um, I don't know, Why the Last Man, for instance. So things like that that were creator-owned. Uh, apparently, some of the impetus for this has come from DC and Warner Brothers executives nostalgic for what Vertigo used to bring to the company. And it can't have been hindered by the recent success of Bodies, only made into a Netflix series when the rights had eventually been returned from DC Comics Vertigo and hindered before that. Uh, if and when Vertigo returns, the lesson learned is that DC and Warners should be open to such projects. Uh, fair enough. I would love to see Vertigo return. But I'm going to throw this ca caveat out there. Vertigo was a really solid line. But Vertigo wasn't just a business idea by DC. It, it, it isn't. It was it was its editorial. Okay. Um, oh, you guys know I'm bad at names. Uh, who am I forgetting all of a sudden? Who is the lady that was the main editor of Vertigo? I'm blanking. Somebody out there help me out. Karen Berger. Karen Berger. Karen Berger, in my opinion, was was a, a, the most important element of what made Vertigo a success. Uh, she was the one that was, you know, saying yes to books like I don't know, Sandman, right? She was the one. It was her tastes, her and and her oversight. Uh, earlier we had that article about how important. Uh, manga editors are well sometimes american editors are important like that too and i think karen berger uh and sort of her protege i'll call her shelly bond hugely important to what was vertigo you know like they, they were the ones that were hiring the talent and approving the products the projects not products i meant projects um karen berger yes kevin street has it here hugely responsible for the British invasion, bringing in your Alan Moores and your um, Grant Morrisons uh, and people like that. It was her tastes. So I, I would love to see Vertigo return. Um, but I think that the thing that would help it most would be having an editor in chief of that line that, you know, had, had a lot of say in what goes. Uh, you, you need somebody with, with, yeah. <laughs> Too woke for me. Karen Berger doesn't get enough um, credit. She, um, she really made something s special with Vertigo. Also, it was like, it was nice because when Vertigo started, it wasn't like there were expectations, you know, it was just a subline sort of imprint of saying with, with the mission statement being, Hey, we're going to make a few of these comics more self-contained and a little more adult, um, and, and, and look, it, it worked. You know, Sandman is still a really popular property. Uh, there was a trailer this week for the Sandman TV show spinoff, Dead Boy Detectives. That that was a, a, another sort of, you know, Vertigo type comic. So, yeah. Uh, wait, there we go. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. Tell you what. Um, I've been going for quite a while. I did not think I was going to talk about news so much, but I guess I, I went on a tangent uh, at the beginning talking about stuff that came out this week, talking about myself and having issues with the camera. So I'm going to do this really brief uh, in terms of talking about the comics that came out this week. And I'm going to have to, unfortunately, like not draw tonight because it's getting late and I have a lot to do with comic tropes. I am working really hard on trying to make an episode about John Byrne that isn't just a hatchet job. I really don't want to be accused of hating John Byrne. I love John Byrne, but I will argue that his work fell off at a certain point. I, I know I'm going to get like hate for that, but I got to do what I got to do. I try to always be honest with my opinions. And I think it's an interesting look at a, at a really talented and interesting creator but that's what i'm working on with comic tropes um what it, what came out in terms of comics this week so i said i don't know where i just placed transformers issue two so here's what i'll do i'll just pick up 
as visual reference, Transformers number one. Here's like a, a, a cover I'm doing. So, but that's issue one. Issue two came out, and it is fun. Boy, does it move at a fast pace! It moves so fast. I blasted through Transformers number two. I think that the most fun thing about it is the art. Daniel Warren Johnson is creating some really dynamic action scenes. He's really focusing on drawing the Transformers mid-transformation when he can, which looks awesome. Uh, he's showing the Decepticons being very dangerous because they're squishing people. And um, let's see, what else? Oh, um, this features the first sort of crossover with G.I. Joe. It's pretty, it's pretty small. But there is a bit of a crossover with G.I. Joe in issue two of Transformers. Uh, I don't think you need to have read any of this stuff before or been into Transformers or G.I. Joe. I think it's legit a fun take on the material. That said, I think that even if you haven't read the comics or bought the toys, because of those movies, a lot of people know about Transformers now. But this is a new take on the material, and it's starting pretty nice and basic. You know, just a very few characters uh, to, to deal with and some interesting human characters, some characters that are not just cookie cutter uh, cutouts. It's really cool. Yeah. I like Daniel Warren Johnson's take on Optimus Prime. He's a badass when it comes to battle, but he has actual uh, emotions and empathy for others. The Transformers live action movies were just bonkers, like how crazy they were. Uh, what was it? Like number number four, I think, was the one with Kelsey Grammer as the bad guy and like an actual human, by the way, not like a robot. And at one point, Optimus Prime just kills him, <laughs> just blows him away with his gun. And that's pretty intense. You know, like you could have easily written like Optimus Prime shoots an electronic gizmo doodad that like you know uh tasers kelsey grammar and he's locked up by the police but no like optimus prime just blows him away uh it's crazy it's just crazy uh but i do recommend it uh what else came out this week that was interesting uh i've been talking up damn them all for a while if you want to see people work with magic in a way where you're not just casting spells. You you sort of have to understand that uh, it costs something. There's sacrifice involved and you have to look for loopholes very carefully or demons will screw you over. Damn them all is badass. It's so good. Oh, the villains are detestable. I think that uh, Charlie Adler, the artist, is. It, I think he's really into this. He, he's inspired because... Um, his Walking Dead stuff was good, but this stuff is great. This is next level. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to find like a, a good dynamic shot to just sort of show off to you. But um, for instance, he takes time with like establishing shots like the House of Commons in England. That can't have been easy to, to set up. I don't know. There's some really creepy stuff with devils and demons and stuff. Here's Asmo Day, which is like bathed in shadow, right? Bathed in shadow, just hanging over the House of Commons, Parliament. This is fun. Uh, I tried the new Punisher. It's okay. It's not great, to be honest. Um, you kind of got a new guy who also happened to have his wife and kids killed which sets him on a path to being Punisher. But the difference is this guy was a, a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent uh, doing like wet works operations. So he has access to all sorts of S.H.I.E.L.D. sci-fi weapons. I will say that like I liked him going up against uh, the, the supervillain Mr. Hyde because he's drastically overmatched. You know, he, he's he's just he doesn't have superpowers in and of himself. And like his weapons are, are pretty much useless against Mr. Hyde. I like that. I, I didn't feel that the dialogue really gave me anything that interesting. I didn't feel like he as a character was more interesting than Frank Castle. Um, 
We'll see. We'll see. I, I didn't love it. But there were two things that I did love that came out this week. Oh, wait, this one didn't come out this week, but I, I read it this week. Volume 7 of Ace Adora by Naoki Urasawa. Oh, I love this creator, folks. Asa Asada is a girl who lost most of her family in a real life typhoon. She's not real, but like it's based on some, some history in a 1956 typhoon. She's grown up in the sixties and she's a 17 year old pilot. And the Japanese government has recruited her to investigate what basically turns out to be a Kaiju off the coast. Uh, here, I'll give you an idea. Look, it, a lot of times it's just been hinted at for like six issues. This is the issue where we finally get to really witness it. And um, I'm trying to see if there's a good shot that I could like give you an idea of. Asa is, is been tasked with investigating it and keeping it from attacking the 1964 Olympics being hosted in Japan. It's amazing. The side characters are so interesting. She's got all these friends that have like interesting journeys in and of themselves, like trying to become a professional runner or trying to become a professional wrestler, trying to become a professional singer. Cause they're all like 16, 17 years old. They're all starting their adult life just about, but they're still in school. Uh, the action and adventure is great. There's a little bit of comedy. This is one of my favorite books that's coming out right now. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, and you'd think like, that's way too much pressure to put on like a 17 year old. Asa is a pretty spectacular individual. She inspires others to be better and she's tremendously motivated. She has a, a great sort of monologue in this. It, maybe monologue is overstating it, but at least the speech where she tries to stick up for her friends uh, in front of their parents to, to be able to do what they want. And because it's like, it's their life ultimately, right? And you only get one of them. And she understands that like, you know, parents want to keep their kids safe and have their best interests at heart, but that it's up to that person to be able to make those choices of what they want to do with their life and that they might really succeed in, a, in an amazing way. Ace Adora took me by surprise. I didn't expect it to be a monster story when I started. Yeah, it builds that way in a very organic way. You really get to know who this character is and her day-to-day -day life and how she becomes a pilot and, and, and why she didn't even have the skills that, or, or get put on the radar of, of the government. Uh, it all makes sense. No, I wouldn't quite call it dusk to dawn. It's more like we, the first issue does say that like in the modern day, there's a Kaiju attack and, it will be stopped by like this one girl. And now we go back in time to learn her life story. So we're going through a lot of her life story to understand who she is and how she came to have the right set of skills and connections and stuff to be able to do something like this, because there's no, there's no superheroes or sci-fi technology in this world. You know, this isn't like a Godzilla movie where there's a Japanese defense force that has maser lasers. Uh, so anyway, Hey, it's my sister. Lovely to see you here. Right as I'm almost wrapping up, Gene, but lovely to have you here. Um, the other book I want to recommend strongly is the new Birds of Prey book. This is only issue three, so you can definitely still get into this. And it's written by Kelly Thompson, art by Leonardo Romero. It is fantastic. The team is Black Canary leading uh, Big Barda. Batgirl, the Cassandra Kane Batgirl, Zealot, and Harley Quinn, and they each have unique skills that make them a very good team. Even though they squabble and bicker and stuff, they each have some complementary sets of skills. And the goal is Black Canary has a younger sister who's being held prisoner on Themyscira. And not that like the, the Amazons, Wonder Woman's people mean her any ill will. I, I shouldn't even say prisoner, but she's being held on Themyscira. And somebody from the future has warned them that like a, 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 an evil mystical entity is going to possess this girl and, and cause destruction. So they have to, they decide they, they're going to sneak onto 
Paradise Island to rescue this girl because because a lot of them have like a vested interest in they, they like her. How do they do that? It's mostly thanks to Harley Quinn. The issue starts with Harley calling in a favor from King Shark. And King Shark summons a Megalodon. And they all hide. The birds of prey hide in the Megalodon as it swims to Themyscira so that they could um, they can like sneak in. And trust me, the one thing that they don't want to do is attract Wonder Woman's attention because they're all like, none of, yeah, even with Big Barda, they're like, yeah, we can't, we probably can't beat Wonder Woman. We, and you know, we could talk to her, but if she didn't agree, we're screwed. So we got to sneak in and do this. Let me acknowledge some super chats real quick. Uh, have I played any of the Spider-Man or Batman games? Yes, uh, to both. I played the Arkham games and I played the Spider-Man uh, games on Sony. They're really good. They're really good. I like them a lot. I like them a lot. And uh, also a super chat saying, hope you can do an episode about Albert Uderzo. Um, I have wanted to talk about Asterix for quite a while. So I do intend to. I do intend to. Okay. Big Barda says like, she's like, Maybe I could. She's like, at, at best, it's a push. She's like, against Wonder Woman, she goes, it depends on what we're each fighting for. She's like, uh, she's being honest. Like, Big Bart is really, really tough. She's like, but against Wonder Woman, she's like, it's a push. Could go either way. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Hulkzilla. Thanks for the fun stream. Best wishes to you and the family. Anyway, how fun is that, though? That, like, Harley Quinn is uh, having them sneak in inside the mouth of a shark. Thanks to, like, calling in a favor from... <laughs> King Shark. I love it. I love it. So those are some of the things that I read this week. Also, um, this is too far along for me to like really break down, but volume 10 of Fist of the North Star, which has come out in English before, but is now coming out in these really nice hard covers by Viz. Uh, volume 10 has now come out and that wraps up basically the first entire story for, um, for, for this whole story. Um, Kenshiro uh, basically gets to sort of like ride off into the sunset in this one. The The creators did come back uh, with a story set several years later that sort of was a second arc. But yeah, volume now you could get volumes one through ten and basically get a complete story. Fist of the North Star is over the top violent, but I think it was tremendously influential to manga that came after it. Um, I mean, it's inspired by manga that came before it, too. Like. I think that Go Nagai's stuff like Devil Man probably inspired Fist of the North Star and some other things. Um, Violence Jack. Well, that was kind of the same guys, but still. Um, but this, I think, continued to inspire. Uh, I, I see a lot of this sort of over the top violence and the way that they approach action uh, being reflected in books like Berserk. I do. So I do recommend it. I read Fist of the North Star. I love Go Nagai. And yeah, Violence Jack is literally the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Violence Jack. Yeah. Bruce Lee and Mad Max. That is just, that encapsulates it all. That is what it is. It's Bruce Lee in the world of Mad Max. Love and Rockets 14 came out this week and it is a beautiful book. Maybe my favorite single issue of a comic this year. Oh, that's nice to hear. I need to get caught up on that at some point. I need to get caught up. I think that that's everything I've got to talk about this week, right? Yeah. If you uh, get a chance, like I say, I've got an interview on the Comic Tropes channel with Joshua Williamson, uh, who's writing all sorts of stuff, but I was excited to talk to him about, get, get kind of nerdy about G.I. Joe. I like G.I. Joe. Uh, so maybe you'll consider checking that out and spreading the word. And then... Um, I'm working on an episode on comic tropes. Uh, I, 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 my whole goal is to get it out this weekend uh, about John Byrne. And I'm trying to find a way to be as even handed as I can for, for my angle here, which is I do love John Byrne's work, but I'm going to talk about when it changed art wise, not, not writing wise. Cause he does both, but I'm going to talk about art. Cause the, I, I, I've, I've, got it down to sort of a specific issue where his art style kind of changed. And I would argue not for the better. We'll see if I'm right. It's 
So um, thank you. I hope you do. Uh, let's see. Love, love and rockets. That's awesome. Hell yeah for love and rockets. Someone needs to gift, gift Chris that giant love and rockets box set. Oh my God. I do want that, but yeah, it's expensive. So yeah. Um, am I going to bring up doom patrol? Uh, I wasn't planning on it. Did something happen with doom patrol recently? Um, or are you talking about the TV show? Cause I haven't watched the TV show version. If you're talking about the comic, I don't know if I heard any news about it this week. You guys giving me such a hard time. I love it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we've gone a little over two hours. I think that's a good amount of time. I will be back next Monday. I'm excited for it. We've got the holidays coming up. I think that we'll have some fun holiday comics to talk about pretty soon. I've got a bunch of ideas for comic tropes. I hope I can find a way to like, you know, commit to making more episodes. But yeah. Um, oh, John Byrne did uh, Doom Patrol. Fair enough. Fair enough. Wasn't going to focus on that too, too much. But anyway. I had a great time talking with all of you tonight. And if you're watching this one, it's archived. I sincerely appreciate that from you as well. It means a lot. I, I like doing this show. This is fun to talk about comics. Uh, it's just fun. It, it Doing this show keeps me excited about comics and about doing YouTube stuff about comics. This, this show is really fun for me, even though it's also a little bit of work. It's fun. But I'm um, going to go get to work on comic tropes and uh, eat a little food. So... Take care. Keep reading comics. Double salute. You earned it. Take care, everybody.